This video was inspired by something that I read that has to do with the dignity of being an inducted member. According to Tommaso Buschetta, that dignity forbids the pleading of insanity to avoid a sentence. He explained, when I was young, a man of honor who was arrested with a clear proof of guilt could not act crazy. This was considered demeaning because it implied that he was unable to accept responsibility for his actions. When we talk about acting crazy, only one person comes to mind, Chinjiganti. So let's talk about how he carried himself and what different people had to say about it. Most of the following information came from research and also Larry McShane's book titled Chin, which I highly recommend. I think we all know why Chin acted crazy. It was a defense mechanism and an added layer of protection against the prying eyes of law enforcement. After all, as a boss, he had a target on his back, so he attempted to keep his status a secret. He was a leader who favored street bosses and panels, not only as that layer of protection, but to keep everyone else in the dark. In my opinion, he was the ultimate strategist. He perfected, like a trained actor, the role of a crazy person. And day in and day out, he went into playing a character worthy of an Academy Award. It's one thing to play a role, but Chin took it up a notch. According to reports, He's been in and out of psychiatric hospitals dozens of times between 1966 to 1995. When medication was prescribed, he would hide the pill under his tongue and spit it out when no one was looking. Speaking of psychiatric hospitals, the subject was brought up by Fat Tony Salerno, Chin's acting street boss. He was recorded inside his East Harlem Palmer Boy Social Club. If he gets pinched, all them years he spent in the fucking asylum would be for nothing. It sounded as if Fat Tony believed Chin's crazy act was in fact a waste of time. Besides taking trips to psychiatric hospitals, Chin was known to wander around Greenwich Village unshaven, wearing pajamas, a bathrobe and house slippers, muttering gibberish. He talked to telephone poles and parking meters and urinate at will in the street, and at times randomly dropped to his knees and crossed himself. This act had the FBI fooled into thinking Fat Tony was the actual boss of the Genovese family. However, all that changed on March 21st, 1986, when Genovese member Vincent Fisk Cafaro was indicted for racketeering. He would begin cooperating six months later, and one of the most compelling things that he would reveal was that Fat Tony was only a front boss, and the actual boss was Chin Giganti. He also divulged that the Genovese family had been playing hide the boss since 1969. In law enforcement circles, when the name Chin came up, only one thought came to mind. In 1981, Agents arrived at 227 Sullivan Street to serve Chin a subpoena. His mother answered the door and said that he was inside. When the agents walked in the apartment, they found him standing naked in the shower, under running water, wearing rubber boots and holding an umbrella. On April 29, 1988, Fish Cafaro testified before a U.S. Senate subcommittee. He told the subcommittee, To the outside world, Giganti is known for his sometimes bizarre and crazy behavior. In truth, he is a shrewd and experienced family member who has risen through the ranks from soldier to capo to boss. His strange behavior, insisting to the outside world that he's crazy, helps to further insulate him from authorities. In the meantime, his control of the family's activities is as strong and calculated as ever. When asked if he thought Chin was crazy, Kafaro replied, I do not think so. This information prompted FBI supervisor John Pritchett and the Genevieve squad to take an even closer look into Chin. But Chin would prove to be a difficult target. He didn't talk on the phone or inside of his club. The tight-knit neighborhood made it difficult for agents to plant bugs in the club. His inner circle was made up of all-time wise guys that were loyal to him. As for the rest of the mob, they not only respected him, but more importantly feared him. The mere mention of his name could get you killed. In an effort to better surveil him, the FBI erected a prefab observation post on a rooftop across from Chin's club. It lasted one day and was mysteriously destroyed. Either Chin's people spotted it or someone from the neighborhood let them know it was there. Years earlier, Pritchett had actually come face to face with Chin. On January 21st, 1986, NYPD detectives Anthony Venditti and Kathleen Burke were working alongside the FBI and surveilling Genovese member Fritzi Juvenelli. There was a confrontation that took place in a Ridgewood Queens diner, and Venditti was shot and killed. Afterwards, agents, including Pritchard, stormed Chin's social club. Chin was taken outside, and Pritchard spoke to him. He claimed that Chin put the crazy act away and spoke perfectly fine to him. With the surveillance post destroyed, agents on the Genovese squad began following all of Chin's movements. They learned he had a mistress on the east side of Manhattan. They secured two observation locations in nearby buildings. 
On one occasion, Pritchard observed Chin entering a waiting car in his old bathrobe and emerged in a suit looking impeccable. Late one night, I observed him with the bathrobe on, but I was close enough to him at the time to realize that underneath the bathrobe, he had a shark skin suit on and a necktie. At the east side apartment, agents watched Chin enter his girl's place, take his robe off, and change into comfortable clothes and act normal. In regard to Chin, Pritchard had said he was probably the most clever organized crime figure I have ever seen. The general feeling is that he is mindful of setting up a defense in case he's ever arrested, and that is why he sometimes acts strangely in public. Chin himself admitted this at one commission meeting. I've invested many years in this crazy act, and I don't want to get caught in any of these meetings or picked up or bugged. In support of his performance, he had his personal family telling everyone who would listen how sick he was. The most outspoken among them was his younger brother, Father Louis Gigante, who continuously attested to his brother's illness. Vincent is a paranoid schizophrenic. He hallucinates, and he's been that way since 1968. And Father Gigante had no problem calling his brother a mental case in public. In May of 1990, Chin was arrested in his bathrobe, pajamas, and a cap. Once he arrived in the courtroom to face the judge, he looked around and said, what a nice wedding, adding proof that he was always in character. This case would take years to get to trial. It would be followed by a second indictment in 1993. The reason for the delay was to determine if he was mentally competent to stand trial. During the competency phase, four psychiatrists were appointed to examine Chin. Two were for the government and two for the defense. And he managed to convince all involved that he was indeed crazy. To one doctor, he said, I don't need an attorney. God's my attorney. And to another, God helps me a lot. He tells me nice things. They would ultimately conclude Chin was not competent to stand trial. The government argued that the psychiatrists and psychologists were not privy to his private behavior and his activities as a boss of a family. To support their argument, they put forth 18 witnesses, over 250 exhibits, surveillance photos, and tape recordings to demonstrate the great lengths Chin went to in order to avoid detection and prosecution. One of the witnesses to strengthen the government's argument that Chin was playing a role was former Lucchese acting boss Al Diaco. Diaco explained the mob's way of handling mentally ill members. If someone developed a mental illness, they would be killed. It's like a mercy killing. Diaco was trying to say that if Chin was really crazy, the mob would have killed him. In the end, the judge ruled that Chin was indeed mentally competent to stand trial. 60 Minutes did a segment titled Crazy Like a Fox about Chin. The prosecutor, Charlie Rose, was a guest and said, It was all a ruse. And Gigante knew his choice was clear. He could walk around in a crazy stupor on the streets or go to prison as happened to Gigante's enemy, John Gotti. After a six-year delay, the trial got underway and ended in July of 1997. The jury convicted Chin of racketeering and two counts of conspiracy to murder. In December of 1997, he received a 12-year sentence. In January 2002, Chin would be reindicted on racketeering and obstruction of justice charges. But on April 7, 2003, he took a plea on that case. Federal Judge Leo Glasser asked him, Mr. Gigante, did you knowingly, intentionally mislead doctors evaluating your mental health? Is that true? Chin responded, yes, Your Honor. After decades of playing a role that in a split second he was able to go in and out of character, his part finally came to an end. And it could be looked at as the longest running part in the history of acting. In regard to Chin's admission, the Forensic Mental Health Association had this to say. Over a period of time, Giganti was a subject of several different competence adjudications. The Giganti saga is of importance because it involved well-known psychologists and psychiatrists who lined up on the two sides of the issue, and because it chronicled the various lay witness opinions that were introduced. After the tortured litigation of the competence issues, Giganti eventually made certain omissions on the record in his federal case to the effect that he's been faking certain aspects of his apparent incompetence. This admission led among other things, to editorials and commentaries by well-known mental health professionals, questioning once again the usefulness of the injection of mental health opinion evidence in forensic settings. Basically, by admitting that he played a role, put into question whether or not the opinions of mental health professionals should come into play during a trial. But Chin, his admission took a load of stress off his shoulders, and he was able to just be himself. Prison guards even reported him to be in a good mood and joining in friendly conversations. So what was the opinion of fellow wise guys on Chin's crazy act? On one FBI 302, an anonymous informant stated, Chin acts crazy because he would be an informant if faced with prison. 
or become a homosexual. I don't know who made that statement, but I wholeheartedly disagree with it. Gambino member Charles Coniglia was overheard saying that Chin was smart for his crazy act. Sammy Gravano felt maybe he enjoyed driving the feds nuts, which he was. Fritzy Giovanelli spoke about Chin's ability to win every card hand. Biggest cheater I know. I guess no one wanted to challenge the validity of his hand. Former Philadelphia underboss Phil Leonetti said, Gravano told him John Gotti hated Chin, mostly because the power Chin possessed, and said it irked Gotti that as regal as he was, he couldn't trump a guy in a bathrobe. As to Chin's crazy act, Leonetti said, Everybody knew it was fake, but nobody said nothing about it. He added that his uncle Nicky Scarfo didn't respect anybody, but he respected Chin. Chin's enemy, John Gotti, had this to say about him. He's crazy like a fox, but told his son, John Jr., I would rather be doing life than be like him. I think the prosecutor, Charlie Rose, sums it up best when he said the following in regard to Chin. I give him that he's weird, but John Gotti used to walk around New York with $3,000 suits while Vincent was wearing a bathrobe. In a very short time, John was wearing a $29 prison suit and Vincent was still walking the streets. I hope you enjoyed this video on Chin and please remember to hit the like button. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, you could do that as well. And if you feel this video may interest friends and family, please share it and thank you. I hope everyone enjoys their weekend and I'll catch you on the next one.